Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our symposium, Contested Collections Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Jade Alboro, and I'm the librarian for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies at UCLA, and I'm also one of the co-leads for the symposium's planning team. This afternoon's program is the third of four programs of this symposium, and we'll be talking about Beyond NAGPRA, Centering Cultural Sovereignty and Indigenous Knowledge Systems. So let us now begin with a welcome video from Virginia Steele, the UCLA Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Ginny Steele, and I am the Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian at the UCLA Library. As we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, we at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which includes the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. Consistent with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we believe that understanding the historical and current experiences of Indigenous peoples informs the work we do. So again, thank you for coming today. We're really happy to have you here as we open this discussion about repatriation, particularly repatriation as it applies to materials that are held in libraries and archives. As many of us may have realized when thinking about the general topic of repatriation, much of the discussion we've heard over the last several decades has focused on artifacts in museums and art held in museums and galleries, but there's been relatively little attention paid to materials that are in libraries and archives. At UCLA, we were contacted a few years ago by a Jewish institution in Munich to return a book to our collection that belonged to their library but was looted by the Nazis. We gladly returned the item but didn't think much more about it. Then last year, we were contacted another time, a second time, this time by the Jewish Museum in Prague. A curator there contacted Diane Mizrahi, our librarian for Jewish and Israel studies. They had identified three books through Hadi Trust that rightfully belonged to their library. The scanned images in Hadi Trust included their property stamps and accession numbers. When Diane communicated the news to her colleagues in the International and Area Studies Department in the UCLA Library, their outreach team led by Jade Alburo felt that it was important not just to share what UCLA is doing in repatriating these books, but to use it as a jumping off point to initiate a broader dialogue about repatriation, why there's a need for it in the first place, and why it continues to be a difficult and complicated discussion. This symposium provides a more global context for this conversation by acknowledging the long history of colonialism, war, and even field research that has led to cultural heritage materials being taken from their communities and countries. As libraries, archives and other cultural memory institutions begin to talk about decolonizing their collections, it is crucial to recognize that decolonization is not just about adding underrepresented voices to our collections, but it's also about understanding how materials in our collections came to be there, how they were obtained, whether they were taken from their original owners without their consent, and whether and how they should be returned to the communities and individuals from whom they were taken. In this symposium, you will hear about various issues related to repatriation, including notions of ownership and caretaking. You'll hear examples from museums and libraries because we hope that many institutions will be interested in exploring and implementing reparative practices. You will also hear examples of existing policies and procedures that institutions and government agencies have put in place. And we'll have some ideas for working with the communities that own the materials in the first place. 
We're very happy to have you with us as we explore this for ourselves and determine what our next steps should be. At the UCLA Library, we are very committed to restitution and we do expect to do more in the future. We hope you will be too. I'd like to thank everyone at UCLA who's been involved in the planning of this symposium, Jade Alboro and Tula Oram for leading the planning team, as well as members Elena Ising, Dana Laterer, and Yesenia Perez. Additional thanks to Sharon Farb, Shannon Tanhai Ahari, Giselle Rios, Magali Salas, the library communications team, and library business services. And thank you to the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies for co-sponsoring the symposium. We appreciate all the hard work of all these individuals and the contributions that have been made. And we thank you for bringing us all together. And to our uh, viewers and members of the audience, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to continued discussion with many of you as we all try to figure out what the best way is to approach the need for us to look at our collections and identify materials that were taken without consent from their owners and return them to the communities and individuals where they belong. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you, Ginny, for those words. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, Camille Collison. Camille Collison is a member of the Talton Nation and is the university librarian at the University of the Fraser Valley in British Columbia and a cultural activist pursuing a PhD in anthropology at the University of Manitoba. Her research critically examines the role of cultural memory institutions and their relationships with indigenous peoples and their diverse knowledges, languages, and cultures by examining best practices related to recovery, revitalization, appropriate access, and repatriation. Everybody, welcome Camille Carlson. Thank you very much, um, Jade. I'm really honored to be here today and I uh, appreciate the invitation. It's my honor to, um, to moderate this panel and we're gonna start off with um, two very distinguished um, um, guests today. Dr. Wendy Gibbons. Uh, Peter is the cultural resource archaeologist for the Santa Inez Band of Chumas Indians and soon to be retired senior curator for archaeology for the Fowler Museum, UCLA's repatriation coordinator and lecturer in UCLA's American Indian Studies. She is co PI on two community based digital projects. Mapping Indigenous Los Angeles 2015 and Carrying Our Ancestors Home in 2019. She's also the co director of the Pumu Catalina Island Archaeological Project in 2007. She serves on several boards and committees, including UC President's Native American Advisory Council, the Indigenous Archaeological Collective and chair of the Society for California Archaeology Cur Curation Committee, and as a founder and advisory board member for the UCLA Tribal Learning Community and Educational Exchange Program. It's also my pleasure to introduce her co-speaker, Dr. Mashana uh, Goldman, who is from the Tonawanda Band of the Seneca. She is a professor in gender studies and American Indian studies and an affili affiliated faculty in community engagement and critical race studies in the law school at UCLA. She is also the inaugural special advisor to the chancellor on Native American and Indigenous Affairs and the associate director of the Center for the Study of Women. In 2020 and 2021, she was a distinguished visiting scholar with the Center for Diversity Innovation at the University of Buffalo, located in her home Seneca territories. Along with journal and book chapters, she is also the author of Mark My Words, Native Women Mapping Our Nations in 2013, co-editor for Keywords in Gender and Sexuality in 2021, and co-PI on a community-based digital project mapping Indigenous LA uh, 2015 and Carrying Our Ancestors Home 
in 2019 and also the California Native Club. So it's my honor to uh, turn it over to you now. Now I see Khan, everybody. We're very happy to be here, Wendy and I, and join you on this very important discussion. Wendy and I thought we would talk a little bit about how we began this project. And part of that occurred because we were talking as an American Indian Studies scholar over the years, I thought I knew about NAGPRA. I thought, you know, I knew the legal literature. I knew the theoretical literature from the various disciplines, such as anthropology, sociology, literature even. Um, I, I, there's, there's many poems about repatriation that I truly love. But it wasn't until I start, started working with Wendy that I really began to think about about what that means in that process. My daughter became an archeologist and anthropologist, and through her, she began to participate in indigenous archeology span as well. She eventually got a job at a museum and a job at a university. And so I learned through that process, the toll that that takes on one. And so Wendy and I were gonna write a book together um, and we quickly decided that wrangling people to write a book and doing that editorship, not only would that take a lot of time and a lot of process, but also it wouldn't have the dissemination that we thought was needed from our work with tribal community members. Um, so instead we decided to that a digital heritage project would be a lot more beneficial to bring to, to bring to people as well. Possibilities with digital humanities include tribal voices and centering those tribal stories as well. That's easier sometimes uh, because uh, TIPO officers and CRM officers do not have the time or capacity often to write a story. Those stories aren't being told. Um, but we did realize that in our in my capacity as a kind of more of a theoretician and somebody that does community engaged research that we could have that use of academia to do the research and that public outreach could go back and forth and the conversation wouldn't be just flowing in one direction or flowing in no direction in a book that might not get read or may get read, et cetera, or may get read in classes, but then not, not uh, disseminated to the community because these books often tend to be quite expensive as well. So we began to think of that. I'm gonna turn it here to Wendy to talk about her practitioner experience also. Thanks, Mishana. And, um, and exactly, you know, I, I think this is the important part is, is what you mentioned is the lack of diversity and what, what information was being forefronted and sort of scholarship around repatriation and, and NAGPRA um, and uh, what that what that really, how that impacted the way people thought about repatriation, which is tended to be very black and white in, everything should go home, everything should be um, returned, and without really thinking about what kinds of uh, difficulties and challenges non-museums, tribal communities were facing in doing this work, both um, from, a, from a physical, um, uh, putting oneself in harm's way, and having to take responsibility for deceased relatives and individuals they no longer had connection to um, and, and knew about to um, just the very fact of what does it mean to rebury? Mm. There's, there's, if you try to type rebury inside a reburial inside a, a, a document, it, it doesn't exist. It's not a real term, right? You're supposed to bury your dead and you don't have to rebury them. So um, just the very concept is, is actually kind of perverse, or very perverse. And um, we have a lot of these conversations in the act of doing repatriation with tribes. We are often talking together about what this work is and um, the financial responsibility, where does the money come from? Where does the supplies one need in order to keep one safe come from? Where does the, um, the time when you're trying to take care of just the basic needs for a tribal community and acting um, in your way, in, in 
in sovereignty and taking care of your relatives? How do you then find time to take care of those who have come before? So there's there's all sorts of very uh, big layers to this work. It is amazing and it's incredibly important to not shortchange how long it took to even get the opportunity to um, be able to remove one's loved ones from display inside museums and in um, small historical centers, just removing them from, from view, but then getting them treated with dignity, respect, and then getting them home. That took decades, decades and decades of really important work. So I don't wanna shortchange that, but then on the, on the other side of that, then being able to explain to people that, just because a community is unable to um, provide the information or provide the, the time and the financial resources in order to get their loved ones, because it becomes a, a, a choice of do you put, do you prioritize getting deceased ones home or do you make sure a project doesn't destroy a burial site? These are often real decisions that Tribal Historic Preservation Office um, directors have to make or or cultural departments or elders councils in trying to take care of that. I, I feel like these um, conversations were being lost in um, in what was being written about. And Ms. Shauna and I really had a chance and, and so many other of my colleagues in American Indian Studies um, to really discuss what are often very sensitive issues and, and what we definitely don't really talk about outside of that repatriation context between the tribes and the museums themselves. So we wanted to be able to provide a safe opportunity for people to hear directly from First Voices and also to acknowledge the long history that happened at UCLA in order to make us one of the leaders in being able to repatriate and um, giving space for un, um, non-federally recognized tribes to also be able to return their ancestors and, um, and what, it, what it actually means. Is that a, a good place to turn it back over to you, Mishana? Yeah, so I'm kind of playing the timeline here because one of the other aspects that we realized it's everybody thinks repatriation began in 1992. What they don't look at is on the ground uh, American Indian activists and indigenous activists who made that law happen in 1992. Now, as Angela Riley, who chairs the committee says, and Wendy and all of us say, a law is only as good as its implementation. But even before that, we, be we began to see early notions of repatriation. And so the thought that it was the law that makes indigenous people want their ancestors back is often what students come to the table thinking. When in reality, this has been something that people have pushed for all their, for their entire uh, act lives. Um, I just recently heard a story from my uncle who was involved in the American Indian movement out of Boston all over. He did a lot of he did a lot of activisms in the 60s and 70s. And he told me this wonderful story about how he just went in. And well, there it was a story. I probably, I don't even know legally if I should say, but, um, but these are something that people wanted. They didn't want to see their ancestors on display. And this has always been the case. So the law, while it makes this, highlights this, I, Wendy and I also found that it's really important to understand that before the law, there was all kinds of uh, movement that occurred on the ground as well. As early as, I'm gonna get the date wrong, Wendy, you can correct me, 1902 or 1906, but was the first repatriation case at Berkeley, right? Is Which date is it, Wendy? Like I'm not. Yeah, I, I wanna say 1896, but it could be yeah. 1906. Yeah, it well, was early. It took, it took a while. But yes. they had been fighting for their ancestors to be returned and against Berkeley. So we want to think about what that might mean and how much, how long that has taken Berkeley to comply, which has one of the worst reputations in the country uh, as well. Um, so law is only as good as its implementation. What does it take to have a university, a museum, et cetera, recognize the importance of this for people, but also the process that's involved? Because as Wendy was saying, it's, it's also about who has the finances to do it. 
Uh, there has been a way when we began this project and such, we have many anthropology departments who are like, oh, we don't collect, we don't do that anymore. We don't, you know, unbury and do this massive amounts of collections and things. But you did. In what now? What do we do now? How do we move on? How do we be ethically responsible even to the past upon what major anthropology departments are built on? How do we hold them responsible? Because the financial aspect of this disinterment of our ancestors and our cultural items often falls on the tribes themselves. And it's not just the financial aspects, it's the emotional and poignant aspects. And with that, um, I, I really hope you can check out our timeline here, as well as the many talks that we have. I, I believe every university should have a timeline, especially if they still hold human remains on what they're doing and have that public outward uh, look for that as well. But we wanted to mostly show you today this really poignant video that we comprised in order so that people could begin to understand how just how important this subject is to tribal practitioners. So let's turn to the voices themselves. Shumawi, Shatipa, Shumawi. For me, you know, my ancestors, my human ancestors are a direct connection to that sacred time of creation, you know, with our narratives, you know. And like some people will talk about, well, you know, well, I pray to God, you know, and for me, it just seems like something that's so powerful that I couldn't have that direct relationship that I do it through my ancestors. They're a link to my life today. I see them everywhere I go, even if it's in the animals or the plants, I see it everywhere. So it's not something that's just in the distant past that you can easily forget. It's almost like an umbilical cord that you have attached to the land or attached to the ancestors, and it's always going to make you. No matter where you go, it's always going to be there. We're just trying to make ourselves whole again. This is who our ancestors used to make it do. We learn from textbooks, some people learn from the visual. So I, I believe that's, that's, the, that's the reason why for repatriation. It's just, it's, it's just that sense of being a whole again. You know, we're fragmented as Indian people, and there's pieces of us all over the world now because some of the stuff just gone to different places. A lot of tribal communities lost so much information and lost a lot of connection, uh, and we had to stop being who we are as people and start becoming as someone else. So repatriation for many tribes is just as simple as bringing things back home. Sure. Native people were sold off down into the blocks, such as down in Los Angeles, that what is now known as La Plaza, were sold off to rancherias and made to work. So in the 1950s, you see assimilation policies through boarding schools, through relocation and termination. And then we also see the state impinging on sovereignty or moving into um, reservation territories. But I knew the importance of, uh, of getting on the inside, because so many times if you stand on the outside and try to make change, well, which is also important too, but getting on the inside, and uh, I think it can be real effective. Could we make archaeologists understand that our worldview was just as important as their needs, as well as perhaps we can educate them. So I represent my tribe, the Changa, on cultural resources issues, preservation of sacred sites. And I've had archaeologists ask, ask me point blank, so are you trying to change the entire practice of archaeology? I am trying to highlight 
that this is a study about a culture and a group of people that are still alive. And those perspectives and those viewpoints should be incorporated in any decisions that are being made about either resources or how you would write up an ethnographic account or how you would portray the definition of an item or a site or a resource that you have people living that have indigenous knowledge which yes may not be rooted in written history but it is rooted in an oral history that's valid is rooted in uh, an indigenous um indigenous uh value system life ways that are still current and still being practiced and that information is equally as valid as whatever science, science, both scientific or archaeological information is being brought to the table. So that is a good place to stop there, because I know we're running out of time and we wanted to talk about where we went since then, since some of these beginning videos that include what is NAGPRA for the in an introduction to what will be our Centering Tribal Stories in Times of Disaster uh, grant and what will be quick creating 12 modules and we're working with UC Davis, UC Riverside and UC San Diego. And we will be kind of discussion discussing all of the various issues about repatriation, cultural heritage item, et cetera, across the board, not all of them, but as many as we can possibly, it feels like all of them some days. Um, but we'll be talking, for instance, about wellness at UCLA. We're talking about water rights, access to water rights, access to what that means when um, water in the flow of it and development in Los Angeles continues to disinter people. Because we are talking about rep repatriation today, but there's an ongoing process, an ongoing disinterring of Native people, particularly in various zones. So we'll be addressing federally recognized, unrecognized. How can you heal from trauma? Or how can you move beyond this when it's still occurring? Um, we'll also be looking at futurity. We'll be in one of the modules that we are working on is um, art and cultural heritage items. This, some people just look at it as a settler temporality. Like this is a past people are trying, people are trying to obtain. But no, it's 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 the future in these in these cultural items that people really care about. It creates a future for our artists, a future for our singers, a future for our basket weavers. So that's something that we look at as well in the 10, uh, well, 10 to 12 modules, but they're they're quite meaty modules so far. Wendy, do you want to discuss any of them? Um, it's just really, I wanted to, to just sort of uh, uh, point out just how important and how diverse the stories are. And so the Centering Tribal Stories was really an opportunity for Michonne and I to extend the rafters as, as uh, the Haudenosaunee say. And, um, and be able to incorporate all of the different ways in which something like repatriation touches um, each, each uh, community. So we, we have often sort of thought about what does it mean to bring ancestors home, but it's way more about those connections and it could be reconnection to land, it can be reconnection to art and all of those. And so we wanted to also, again, um, broaden the scope because um, it's way more than, than just talking about bringing ancestors home. It's that revitalization and that space in order to, to practice um, culture without being dismissed or belittled as, um, as Laura mentioned in the, the, the video. And, um, and this is what Michonne and I have been hearing from so many of our colleagues. So we look forward to there being lots more videos and lots more opportunities for you all to learn in the classroom and share them and share those voices, even if you can't have people come in. And there'll be four components to each module. Each will have an original material, whether it's a video, an interview, or a map is, is also might be on the board, uh, my particular favorite. 
thing to work with. Um, it, but all the questions will be come from interviews and from what tribal practitioners really care about. There'll be primary documents that will be pulled from university archives and libraries, and there'll be secondary sources of analysis. And we'll also be doing classroom assignments that are appropriate from the practitioner's point of view. Um, as always with Wendy and I's projects, our digital projects, we try to run everything by the community, not just once, but but many, many times until we can get it appropriately right. Uh, just some of the names of the modules. The first module will be what is NAGPRA. The second will be land introductions in which I'm on seven. I have seven podcasts that will be released in the UC system about the university and tribal relationships um, and student relationships as well. Navigating land repatriation, rematriation that is UC Davis is doing. Health Consequences and Caring for the Ancestors, which Cliff Trafser will be uh, working on. And he, he went well above and beyond. It wasn't just one video he did or one thing. He, he took six really important uh, tribal elders in the, in the Riverside area and uh, got their notions of uh, wellness and repatriation and why it was important from CRMs and TIPOs. Artifacts, Art and Present Practice, I don't like that title, so I'll probably change it, but Art and Present Practice will be what we also look at. Climate Change and Cultural Heritage that at UC Davis, Isabel Rivera Colazo will look at that from Puerto Rico um, perspective and what it means for climate change in Puerto Rico when the beaches expose cultural heritage items there. I think that's really gonna be an important one where, which often doesn't get discussed, is the effects of climate change on cultural heritage protection. Traditional ecological knowledge at Caravagna, Wendy is heading that up, but we have now also, we will work with uh, Bayona Creek area, which many of you may know as Silicon Beach area, which was uh, a site of mass destruction. One of our tribal, uh, uh, people that we work with quite closely. Desiree Martinez is part of the Indigenous Archaeology Lab. Uh, sh she's ready to do that now. So we <laughs> waited till they were ready. Protecting genomic data of Indigenous communities. We have Kiolo Fox, who's Kanaka Mali. He will be looking at that in terms of Hawaii. And then we're working with Siba, hopefully, on, um, on a particular basket weavers, preserving, promoting, and perpetuating a healthy environment. For weavers. And then Terminated and Unrecognized Tribes by Mark Minch de Leon, who also will be working with his own tribes um, um, as well in Northern California. And he'll be looking about what does it mean to have a voice within these issues. And then we're working with a wonderful, beautiful film, which I know is almost at completion, called Homeland or Dehi Wallach, which Hulea, uh, Hulea Sinajini is one of my favorite artists, will be uh, working on as well. And so that will, that will kind of be coupled with the land instructions around the same. So that is what we are working on. That's the future of what we're hoping to do. And eventually, and I'm going to let Wendy talk to the international aspect we hope to work on, but with this, this particular Centering Tribal Stories in Times of Disaster, we hope to create a curriculum that we can use in the community, tri the developing tribal community colleges across California, so that there will be a direct credit from tribal community college into the universities, because it's not good enough just to have videos, you have to disseminate, and you have to have people within the university that can also interact and uh, be trained to do, to, uh, do TIPO CRM management practitioner stuff. Wendy, do you wanna talk about the international? Um, really quickly, cause I know we um, have to move on, but I will say that everything as it's being created will be available through our Caring Our Ancestors Home um, website, which um, Mishana has shared, I believe in the chat. And, um, and that's where you should look. We're using the Mukuru platform and um, which is a really important. And we, we really hope to add in, we've already started working with um, Rapa Nui and uh, Te Papa, and we, we hope to add more of the um, international stories, more stories within the Shumash homelands and, um, and all of our peers. So uh, be sure to reach out to us and we're happy to answer more questions and we're always looking for new collaborators. And you can visit our website. We will have the What is NAGPRA up, um, 
curriculum up shortly, actually very shortly before even fall. Um, and then we also have a lot of primary resource material online. And as there have been NAGPRA repatriation recordings, we have asked people if we could share them on our website. So that's a great place to go for resources. So Nyawe, with that, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madhu. I really appreciated learning about that and the modules sound fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, Mishana and Wendy. I appreciate that. And our next um, panelist today in the uh, continuing uh, presentation for Beyond NAGPRA, Centering Cultural Sovereignty and Indigenous Knowledge Systems it, uh, is um, uh, Chief uh, Mutuani, um, Mutaj and uh, Lynn Malerba, which she is the uh, 18th chief of the Mohegan tribe and the first female chief in the tribe's modern history. She follows her mother, uh, Loretta Robert, who served on the tribal council and her great grandfather, Chief um, Madaga, and, in tribal leadership. Prior to becoming chief, she was the chairwoman of the tribal council and served in the tribal government as executive director of health and human services. And then had a love, a lengthy career as a registered nurse and served as the director of cardiology and pulmonary services at Lawrence and Memorial Hospital. She's earned both a doctorate in nursing practitioner at Yale University and was named a Jonas Scholar. She was also awarded an honorary doctorate in science from Eastern Connecticut State University and um, a second doctorate, uh, honorary doctorate degree in humane letters from University of St. Joseph. So currently she's the so she chairs the Tribal Self-Governance Advisory Committee of the Federal Indian Health Service and is a member of the Justice Department's Tribal Nations Leadership Council, the Tribal Advisory Committee for the National Institute of Health and the Treasury Tribal Advisory Committee. And she serves United, United South and Eastern Tribes Board of, Sec uh, Board of Directors and Secretary. So it's my honor to uh, welcome you here today. And I apologize if I mispronounced that your name. You did just great. And I say greetings. And um, Camille, I would ask you to kind of come back on screen um, when my time is up, just so that I don't go over my time. Um, but I do appreciate everyone's uh, participation. And I'm so anxious to hear um, everyone's uh, presentations because they're really terrific. And so I would say a week is good day. Um, I am called Chief Many Hearts Lynn Malerba. And so I'm going to begin uh, my discussion with a video. And then I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we've approached repatriation and rematriation. It's a bit different. Um, and, I, and I'm going to share a video that we um, made with, um, with Cornell University uh, because they uh, were very, um, you know, very, uh, instrumental in returning some uh, very important documents to us. Um, so let's see if I can do this in the right way here. We've lost so much over the years, and then when you have a chance to bring some of it back, it's, it's just absolutely an amazing gift, really. It's you know, grateful, and, and it's um, very heartfelt. Uh, it's very emotional. In our Mohegan beliefs, when someone creates something, whether it's the written word, or whether it's um, you know a bowl, or you know a piece of wampum, you imbue your spirit into those, um, into those objects. And we knew that Fidelia really wasn't keeping her diaries and her documents for the Mohegans of that present day that she was in, but it really was to leave a legacy behind for future generations. Fidelia knew that she needed to preserve that language and those words. And so her work is extremely important to us because as we look at restoring our language now, just having her documents and her spirit come home to us is going to be very meaningful to our entire community. It was clear that 
the having the diaries um, with the Mohegan tribe as they work on this language project was really um, would be critical for its success. So we're pleased that uh, we'll be able to transfer them. In preparation for the transport of the uh, collection to Connecticut, every item was given an individual protective enclosure, which helps buffer any changes in the environment that they might experience along that journey. And then they're consolidated inside the custom-made clamshell box, which gives it physical and chemical protection during that time. We temporarily look after materials. That's what we do. So we're very grateful that they're coming home in such good condition and proper yeah. care all these years. It's a privilege and an honor for us. We just are, are still, I guess, awestruck at the fact that you know we're able to receive her words back into our community. Going home. Uh, so I, I wanted to share a little bit about our approach to repatriation and rematriation because NAGPRA is a very important law, um, but it doesn't always serve our purpose as well. And to go back to why some of our collections, our objects of cultural patrimony ended up in museums, it dates back to you know, the early 1700s, 1800s, uh, when archeologists and anthropologists thought they were doing tribes a favor uh, by digging up our burial grounds, by taking our articles of cultural patrimony and putting them in museums. Because, it, and at the time, the thinking was that the tribes would vanish, that we would no longer exist, and so therefore they were preserving our histories for us. And as we know, despite all of their best efforts, we are still here and we're proud to still be here. And as we think about those objects of cultural patrimony, no one has the right to alienate them from our tribal community. And um, I will talk a little bit about Yale and Cornell as you just saw that uh, video and then Dartmouth because those are our three biggest events of a cultural repatriation and rematriation. Yale University had many, many, many artifacts, um, very important artifacts in their um, uh, museum at the Peabody Museum. And they had them there for years. And one was a mortal and pestle that went back to the early 1700s. Another was a bowl with inlaid wampum uh, that was uh, Chief Uncas's daughter's bowl. And another was a doll. And then multiple, multiple um, items that had been dug up from our burial grounds. And initially when we approached Yale, they were very hesitant to give the articles back to us. Um, and you know, we started to go down the path of NAGPRA, but we decided that rather than using law, we would use diplomacy. And so we chatted with the president of Yale and we chatted with David Skelly, who is a director of Yale Peabody Museum to talk about why those objects belonged with Mohegan, because they do contain our ancestors and they do contain our history, but our history and our ancestors inform who we are today. And it allows us to connect with our unique cultural heritage and bring that forward for further generations. And so as we talked about it and we continued to talk about it, um, David Skelly, who is the director of Yale Peabody had a wonderful idea. He said, you know, museums do intra-museum, museum to museum transfers all the time. So rather than go through NACPRO, why don't we just do a museum to museum transfer? We have a, a wonderful museum. It's the oldest Indian owned and run museum in the United States. It was formed in the 1930s. And we have the collar of our great chief Uncas from the 1600s, his wampum collar still intact um, in that museum. So we know that we can take care of anything that comes back to us. And we've recently built a cultural preservation center that has can house all of our archeological um, um, artifacts as well as allow us to do research. Um, and so as we talked about it, that became a very simple process. We developed a letter of agreement and all of those objects came back to us. And we were so thrilled to have them back in our community. We have a celebration for that. Next, we began talking to Cornell University because we understood that Fidelia Fielding's diaries had been somehow ended up in their library. And I think it had a very circuitous route to get there. But again, we believe that her words will help us with our language restoration uh, project because she was writing those, those words in English and Mohegan and keeping those diaries in English and Mohegan. 
not for herself, for her future generations, because she was beaten for speaking that language. But I think she had, she was prescient. She knew that we would restore our language at some point in time. And so she preserved those languages for us and that language for us. And Cornell University was just fabulous. As soon as we approached the president, and we always, from a diplomatic uh, perspective, we would, from a government to the president of the university is how we would approach it. And then they would typically steer us to whomever would be making the decision. Um, and so when we approached the president, she absolutely um, was supportive and, and sent us to Gerald Beasley, who was the head librarian at the time. And as he said, we were keepers and we were keeping this, but absolutely we know that they these words belong with you and we are happy to return them home. So flash forward to just a few weeks ago, one of our tribal counselors uh, attended Yale and she is a Yale tribal advisor um, and is on a committee with the, um, a Dartmouth College. And Dartmouth had all of the papers from Samson Occam, who was a very revered person and his writings predate Fidelia Fielding's writings. His writings were from the 1700s. And so he was educated by Eliezer Wheelock um, and he was fluent in Algonquin languages. He was fluent in Greek, Latin, and English, and he was an ordained minister as well as an herbalist. So he traveled to um, England to raise funds for Dartmouth College, which was supposed to be in Lebanon, Connecticut, and it was supposed to be a college to educate Indian students and Indian children. By the and he raised um, the equivalent of about $6 million, I believe, um, in pounds in the 1700s when he was in England. And when he returned home, he found out that the charter for the college had been changed. It was no longer going to be to educate Indian people um, and that it was gonna be relocated to Hanover, New Hampshire. So he has a treasure trove of documents about all of his travels throughout New England. Thank you, Camille, as well as, um, as well as his work in England and his work with Dartmouth. So now we have all of his documents home and his manuscripts home, but it was really through diplomacy that we were able to accomplish this. And we are so grateful to those universities for actually remembering that where all of those documents and, and objects of cultural patrimony should be are with the people who created it. So I will leave my comments there, but thank you Camille for giving me the heads up and I will look forward to everyone else's comments and presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and I really um, enjoyed it and learned quite a bit uh, from you. It's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Jennifer O'Neill, who's an assistant professor at, at Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies at the University of Oregon and a co-director of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Academic Residential Community. She's an enrolled member of the Confederate Tribes of Grand Raj in Oregon. And her interdisciplinary research and teaching focuses on Native American and international relations, history with an emphasis on sovereignty, self-determination, cultural heritage, global Indigenous rights, activism, and legal issues. The work is dedicated to centering Indigenous traditional knowledge, developing place-based education, and implementing guidelines for the ethical research of Native American communities and management of cultural heritage collections. She, um, over the last 15 years, she has led the implementation of the best practices for Native American archival materials in the non-tribal repositories in the United States through the collection development and sharing of the protocols for Native American archival materials that were developed and uh, presented in 2006. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Camille, for the great introduction. And um, I know a few people shared some a lot of great links already. I just put in the actual original link to the protocols for Native American archival materials in case anyone wants to uh, take a look at that and just have that as a resource. Um, I first just wanna give a huge thanks to all of the organizers and uh, people who are work behind the scenes to put this conference together. It's wonderful to be able to see all of this work come together and just wanna honor and recognize my fellow presenters as well. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, I feel like a good bookend to 
uh, a lot of what has already been presented today, just kind of giving um, a conclusion of um, not only what's been talked about, but echoing a lot of what has already been said and kind of ways forward and um, just some of my thoughts around particularly the repatriation of um, not only objects, but focused on archival materials. So as what you'll hear me talk about is really echoing a lot of what you've heard from our speakers today and building upon what they've already said with their really great examples and projects. So their uh, projects that have been presented today really reflect this larger shift over the last decade where institutions and researchers are collaborating and building respectful relationships with Native American and indigenous people whose collections they steward uh, or whose collections they are working to um, return. And I just also wanna echo what um, Mishana and others have said that um, although uh, NAGPRA was developed and passed in uh, the early 90s and 1992, much of the work and activism around this law even happened even before that. And so much work has happened after that. And much of the work that I've been involved with has centered around how we can create protocols and guidelines for archives that um, are not included in NAGPRA and that uh, the gaps that are created when um, mainly objects are covered by that law, but what do you do when um, you have archives and records and photographs and recordings that are not connected to that law? And how do we ensure that those collections not only are properly cared for um, with protocols, but also how can we actually have the return of those collections? So this much needed change in curatorial and research practices comes from this larger awakening and reckoning um, by non-Native curators and researchers in various different disciplines to both decolonize and unsettle past colonial paternalistic collecting and research practices that have displaced dissociated and disconnected collections from uh, indigenous communities. In addition to institutions realizing their curatorial responsibility to collaborate um, responsibly with Indigenous people. Uh, this change is also due in part to the implementation of Indigenous research methods, curriculum, and training in undergraduate and graduate programs where um, we have both Native and non-Native academics who are increasing their understanding of knowledge of centering Indigenous ways of knowing into their research and curatorial practices. Um, and how can we go beyond the law and how can we ensure that uh, collections are returned to native communities. So this turn toward return and decolonial practices also stems from an increasing number of Native American and indigenous people working in repositories and in the academy. And um, of course, amazing, incredible uh, tribal leaders um, who are at the center of a lot of these projects, which you're hearing about today. So, um, these practitioners and um, scholars, elders are increasingly finally consulted and providing expertise, which, which is being shared today to help really guide these projects. Um, so what I want to do, though, is just turn toward um, some of the gaps, though, that we're seeing or where we ne need to really turn some of our attention and just more of um, thinking in the future and in current major challenges that we're seeing. So while many institutions are finally making some of these much needed changes to their collections, there are still many that are uh, need to acknowledge and recognize um, many of these problematic colonial histories and substantial changes that need to occur in their repositories. And many finally are doing that work. Um, and we've seen increasingly, again, over the past 10 to 15 years, many repositories who um, are working with Native American uh, tribes and uh, collections to collaborate on those collections. And, and that's often done by um, the acknowledgement of how the collection was acquired and also ways that the community can be involved with their, the curation of those collections. But what I want to turn toward is actually the return of some of those collections and why that's so important. So rather than just simply digitizing content and hiring Indigenous archivists, 
which are definitely important steps. Institutions also need to establish long-term uh, collections policies that hold these institutions accountable for their colonial collecting policies, ensuring that indigenous people have not only meaningful access um, to these collections, but hold the institutions accountable and how the institutions can actually work to return collections if that is um, in the best interest of the communities, which we're seeing, we saw uh, some really great examples that was shared just before this of where that is in, what's in the best interest of these communities. So we're seeing some examples of that. Um, of course, this is not without its challenges, but many scholars and institutions have and continue to address this and find some solutions to these issues through providing access, context, and the either digital return or physical return of collections. Um, and what I want to acknowledge here is that while the digital return of collections has become a solution for some institutions uh, to provide Indigenous communities access to and connection with the collections, this process um, fails to provide the actual physical return of, and so tribal communities are not able to actually physically interact with the collections uh, sometimes if there's a digital return, but not a physical return. Um, and of course, digital people want to, and have the desire um, to actually physically interact with those collections. And um, because that is centering that knowledge and the physical item in back into their uh, community. So no matter the medium, um, the collection, whatever that might be, whether it's a photograph or a document or a journal, um, these items hold really strong relational and holistic meaning for our communities. So being able to have that physical access to it is just as important as also providing digital return, which is also, um, of course, a, a meaningful step in the right direction. But we really want to get to how can we provide and have a physical return. Um, so what I wanted to highlight is just some of what we're seeing um, in this area. And as I mentioned, you're, you're already seeing some of the examples here that was provided before. Um, so while a digital return and decolonization must continue to be the baseline for um, these collections, um, we must also uh, think forward and think about what are more substantial goals for indigenizing research, archives, and the return of collections. So I'm, what I'm asking is us to, uh, to think about how to shift the standard beyond just digital return, but actual the physical return. Um, and what I mean by this, and it's already been noted before, but much of what we see in a lot of our community is so much time and attention that's had to be spent on many uh, of our tribal elders, as well as those who are tribal cultural um, heritage uh, managers have to spend so much time on these issues. And so we just want to highlight that while NAGPRA exists as the legislative authority for the return of objects, um, it's important to think about how um, uh, materials and archives are not included in that and how currently federal or state laws do not exist for the return of archival collections that document those sacred indigenous traditional knowledge. So um, the digital return of cultural heritage collections has increasingly, of course, become the solution. Um, but when institutions are, are not uh, legally mandated to physically return collections, that can kind of be another kind of way around it. Um, however, what I would like to suggest is we think about ways uh, of returning collections that are in the spirit of the law. And just because a law does not yet exist doesn't mean institutions can't um, already return collections. And we're seeing that in the precedents that are being set here um, for the Mohegan tribe, working with Yale and with Dartmouth. Um, and so uh, while the return of collections is not as prevalent in archives, it does not mean it's not possible. It's always an option and should become the new standard. If just a few repositories um, can be the first in admitting their role in these um, historically um, colonized way of collecting these collections and um, they can provide the example for other repositories to follow, which is um, what we've seen here. 
Similarly, recently Native American and Indigenous peoples across the United States and Canada have called for the return of Indigenous land through the larger land back movement. While this movement increased substantially over recent years with the Idle no, no More movement and land demonstrations to reclaim the Black Hills in South Dakota, the fighting for return of ownership and stewardship of land to Indigenous peoples has existed since colonization. Um, according to Nikita Longman, a community organizer uh, from George Gordon First Nation in Canada, they say any time an Indigenous person or nation has pushed back against the oppressive state, they are e exercising some form of land back. So rather than simple return or transfer of land deeds, the movement also includes respecting indigenous rights, preserving languages and traditions and ensuring food sovereignty, housing, clean air and water. But above all this, it's a rallying cry for a dismantling white supremacy and the harms of capitalism. And indeed, over recent years, um, tribes have made small efforts and wins in gaining original Indigenous treaty land back. We've seen this in uh, 2020 with the Nez Pierce tribe, who successfully reclaimed a small portion of their traditional homelands and hundreds of years after the U.S. Army forcibly removed them from the Wallala Valley in eastern Oregon. And um, in other areas, of course, in the example shared today, uh, we've even seen the actual return of collections by repositories who know it is in the best interest of the tribe. So um, if large organized churches can return land and buildings, so too can large national, federal, and regional repositories return collections back to Native American and Indigenous communities. Um, I, I um, call on our institutions who have our collections to let us all be leaders in committing to doing this work for ours and future generations. Just as indigenous people seek a connection to land, so do they seek a connection and return of their cultural heritage, including records, recordings, photographs, and languages that were meant to be preserved on our traditional homelands. What if various repositories and professions across um, the nation led the way in the collections back movement. Think what a difference this would make in the reconciliation and healing of indigenous communities. Repositories could um, agree that as part of each community engaged project, they will also include the return of at least a portion of a collection as part of that reconciliation. So there is not just the intellectual return or digital return of the collection, but the actual physical return of items that belong in indigenous communities. Once this begins to happen, it opens up a whole new baseline and vision for Native American and indigenous studies scholarship collections um, that is grounded in true ethical, respectful and reciprocal relationships. Um, the re uh, reconciliation, justice, and healing that would emerge in Native American and Indigenous communities with the return of collections would be life-changing for our Indigenous livelihood. Uh, so I hope that um, some of these comments and suggestions might help you to think um, how this kind of all comes together for both the examples that you've seen here today and how these can also be examples for other institutions and repositories as they're engaged in uh, collective work together. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a terrific presentation. And I'd just like to invite all of the um, panelists to come back and we'll um, have a bit of a panel discussion. Um, so that would be great. And I found um, today's panel very illuminating and I'm excited to see everything that's happening across, um, across uh, the United States um, to do with um, uh, the work within repatriation. One of the things that I think that we can all recognize as um, Indigenous people is some of the ways that NAGPRA um, might have fallen short. And so I just wondered if each of you might like to um, comment on what improvements could be made and um, what can be done about um, items that were not actually included in NAGPRA. So sometimes, um, uh, many times we're dealing with things like oral histories or films and sound recordings. So um, maybe we can go to you first, Wendy, since uh, you've, everybody else has spoken recently. And I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit about um, those improvements and we'll just go around and I'll call. 
Um, I'm, I'm happy to start and, and thank you to everyone. I've really enjoyed um, hearing all the panelists and, and all the work that's been done. And um, it's it was really, it's been very interesting sort of watching uh, the development of the implementation of NACRA over the last um, 32 years um, and, and how, how far and not far we've come. Because 30 years, you think that that would be a significant amount of time for us to move this ball a little bit farther down the court than, um, than the conversations that we're still having. Um, it, it becomes a little frustrating to, to hear the same sort of um, conversations, you know, simply like, hey, you really should give them back. No, 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 really. You should give them back. It's okay. We understand it's hard, but you really should. So um uh, digital repatriation is actually one of those words that I really can't stand. Um, uh, you know, I, I understand the sentiment, but uh, sharing files is something we all do as colleagues. We're not giving anything back if you are returning the, the book, um, just as Lynn was sort of discussing. That's repatriation. That is, you know acknowledging that it doesn't belong to you and it really belongs to someone else. And, and I'm really um, happy that the foundation of this was about returning um, books back in, um, into libraries that were taken during the Holocaust. So, I mean, I think that these are the kinds of things that should have been part of a conversation when we were talking about um, repatriation to Native American tribes. And I'm, I'm really happy and I, I remember hearing this really impactful conversation from um, the Miami tribe in returning some council books that was that were inside a museum and how you know council books are not necessarily think, thought of in terms of like something that's sacred or or what we typically think of, but um, they are not owned by an individual. They are actually covered under NAGPRA, and and um, so I, I'm. I'm grateful that the conversation is being had, but repatriation legislation didn't lack in, in um, thinking about them. They were, um, they were lacking in the creativity and the understanding by the museums and libraries and institutions in knowing that it was going to be a ride. It could be anything. NAGPRA applies to everything. And then it is up to the tribes to decide what needs to come home and then to make sure that that happens. And I, I think that that's something that we've always strived to accomplish at UCLA. And, um, and we need to do more of that. So um, Cal NAGPRA, I just want to sort of briefly say that there's now a state law that actually says just that. It says, no, really, you have to start with a tribe, which is in the law, which is in the federal law, and then you go for it. But that's where we need to begin. So consultation matters. It Thanks. does. And I also think that um, in terms of NAGPRA, we can't just limit it to things that were in the ground, you know, things that were in a great, you know, because as I said, you know, we don't believe that any object of cultural patrimony can be alienated from the tribe and no one has the right to alienate it from the tribe, but yet things were alienated from the tribe. And why was that? People were starving. People were starving and they said, geez, you know, I, I shouldn't sell this, but, you know, and, I, and I'm only presuming, you know, that some things happened that way, you know, in the 1600s, starving, you know, and, you know, I'm starving because of the, the colonists policies. So unfortunately, I am going to have to let this go. Um, and so, you know, there are many, there are many objects that tribes would want back. Um, and, and I agree with you, digital copies is not repatriation. What we said was just the opposite. Sure, you can have the digital copies and people can, you know, access them for scholarly purposes. We're okay with that, but we want the originals. Um, and I think tribes just need to be clear about that. Yeah, I think what also needs to be addressed too is how, um, I've been working with our librarian, who's wonderful at UCLA, Joy Holland, and we have, um, who's the librarian for the American Indian Studies Center here, and the 
The problem is with some of the state universities also is the issue of copyright law or ownership laws or it being in, in Boston private and property law, right? right? So when we have collections coming in that might be a more pan-Indian collection, for example, the, the tribe's not having ownership over it gets real messy real fast, right? Over who has ownership over it. Um, and uh, and who has the right to decide what is studied or not studied. And so while there can be closed files or open files, I really feel that the tribes always being under UCLA as ownership or whether this came up with my students who were collecting oral histories for instance, at one point, they're like, how can the library have ownership over my material? Because right. it all seems like a wonderful practice, right? It seems like a good feeling thing, but there has to be a way we begin to, we begin to kind of think outside those property logics when it comes to repatriation and tribal sovereignty and putting forth a self-determined tribal practice within libraries. So I'll just leave it there. And we are trying to work with that. And I see there's a question here about does UCLA have a tribal consultation policy? We do not have a policy writ large. <laughs> Wendy and I have a policy um, <laughs> for all our projects. We have uh, multiple kinds of policies, but at the UC level, we are working on an MOU with tribes, but for something very specific in terms of hunting, uh, Hunt, I always say hunting because I'm from the East Coast, gathering, caretaking, <laughs> <laughs> gathering and caretaking and planting rights. Um, so at, at for the Gabrielino Tamva and Tavium, hopefully eventually as well. So um, we do have that's being developed now, but it does become difficult because of federally recognized and unrecognized tribes, which we have not discussed here today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. And Jennifer, I wondered if you could um, maybe address that and just talk a little bit about um, even in relation to some of that and also to the protocols for um, things that um, uh, can be done or what improvements can be made. That would be great to get uh, your take on that as well. And then we'll move on to some of the questions that are in there that have been posed by the audience. Yeah, I think um, what I would add to that is just noting, first of all, how in the protocols for Native American archival materials, there's an entire section that covers the copying of materials, but then also the repatriation of materials. So for those who want to know more about that, they can go straight to that section, um, which gives in the protocols, it gives guidance both for the institution and also for the, um, the tribe as, as well. And so what I'd say about that is we developed that entire section. We developed these in 2006. And so since then, of course, we've had uh, the passage of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so that's the caveat I would give for that too, is that just remembering that um, that uh, declaration is not yet in the protocols. We're updating that and adding more information and more details. However, um, we wanted to include a section on that because that's the one of the hugest gaps, of course, with NAGPRA is it doesn't cover the accompanying materials that might have went along with um, uh, the objects or human remains um, that um, went along with those collections. But um, it also just doesn't cover archival materials in general that have that are culturally sensitive that were taken without consent um, that just have a very historic um, way that they were gathered and without consent. And of, of course, that's a huge section of UNDRIP is you must have consent from the community. You must have free prior informed consent, um, particularly related to not only collections, but um, intellectual property and cultural heritage. So um, this is a huge section that is very important and that we were trying to cover because that's the huge gap with NAGPRA. Of course, it's covering objects and human remains, which that was a huge first step for, for getting that law passed. But of course, free law isn't, doesn't cover everything. And so that's why we developed the protocols was because we saw um, while objects, there was a call for objects to be documented and to start working with tribes. But the huge thing um, that is the gap with 
archives is because there was no official law created for the return of archives, there's no call then out to institutions to create a list of everything they have that should be returned. The onus, unfortunately, is on tribal communities, which places a huge burden on communities to do that work. Many of them are doing that work, but it should not just be placed on tribal communities. It should be on the institution to recognize and con make their lists, contact tribal communities, uh, because that puts so much of the burden on tribal communities and not just time, but funding um, and time to then go to those collections, which communities don't always have funding to travel to those communities to look at them, to start to collaborate, to actually have the process start for a return. So things people need to keep in mind, just the practical side of it um, that goes into doing this work, which is why it's so important for the institutions that have these collections to take up that responsibility um, as part of this larger movement. I think, I think that's a very good point because the responsibility really is the institutions who did the collecting during the era of colonization rather than the tribal communities paying for that um, again and again and also paying for the repatriation um, work. I think the next, we only have a few minutes left. And so one of the questions, I'm going to combine a couple of them to be able to ask you this. So when museums or libraries or archives are working through the repatriation process, um, I guess what kind of um, good practice and maybe just um, quite quickly would you um, suggest? And one of them, um, they talked about dealing with the collections with um, derogatory language and identifiers um, uh, when working through repatriation and identifying um, the tribal collections. But I think that there's also um, other things that we can suggest as well, too. So what would we suggest when they're dealing with some of these derogatory terms? And also, how would they go about um, respectfully working through uh, repatriation? And I think I'll start off with uh, you, Lynn, and you can go first, and then we'll go in, in a bit of a circle here. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we did not experience that. Um, but the one thing I would say was, you know, people initially questioned our ability to care for, you know, the things that we were requesting to come home, which I think is a little insulting. Um, the other, um, the other thing that we experienced was um, sometimes um, people would say to us, but, you know, we have a good chain of custody here. Um, we understand how we got them. We, we paid for them. Um, or somebody paid for them and then donated them to us. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really important is just to think about what's the moral imperative here. You know, we don't actually care how things got to the museum necessarily. And we don't, you know, we don't, we don't care necessarily about that chain of custody. But what we care about now is, okay, all of that happened. But don't you have a responsibility to our tribal community? Um, and I think that that's the most important takeaway. And, you know, and I think that we were really fortunate because the people that we encountered on this journey understood it um, and not to disparage attorneys, but their job is to protect the institution, not protect our tribal community. And so once you begin to go down that legal path, I think it makes it more difficult sometimes with NAGPRA. Um, and so if there is a way that you can just enter into a, an agreement with the institution rather than have to kind of go down that very circuitous path of NAGPRA, it's better for everyone. It's better for the institution. It's better for us. And we can recognize, you know, their, their gift of, of, of you know, um, openness and their gift of, you know, being willing to consider what it what's important to our community and what's more, you know, who is it more important to our community or their community, right? So I, I would leave it at that. Thank you so much. And Michelle, did you want to contribute to that? I, I think she pegged it. What is the ethical responsibility of universities? I feel like with the land acknowledgements, which I call land introductions, because it's an introduction and that after an introduction, you have to follow up, you have to be responsible. You can't say you didn't know what you should know, you know, so I feel like um, with that universities and different um, I think sometimes universities can be really huge, such as UCLA, right? And have all these disparate functions and places, but there really has to be a way 
that the university set forth an ethical way that they're going to be dealing with all of these questions which are related. Um, for instance, and thinking part of the reason we have land introductions and the modules on cultural repatriation is not just because I'm the weirdo out in the, in the group where we have all the experts that are doing uh, tip, working with TIPO and CRM, but because you can't say you want to increase attendance of native students, that you want to retain native students and that you want to commit to diversifying faculty and still hold on to remains and collections that are not yours and not act in good faith on that. So I really feel that what we have to do as a university is not look at all these things as separate, but really try to look at it as an ecosystem that you're trying to create to have better tribal relationships in general. So that's that's kind of how I that's how I see it. And um, I spoke earlier that we have to rethink how our gift of deeds work in libraries. I really believe that is true. Um, we are trying to uh, trying to keep looking in a different um, circumstance. Um, trying to keep um, Seneca and Haudenosaunee material in territory. And uh, but we we come up against again that idea of ownership and gift of deed and how it operates. So mm -hmm. we have to begin to think of these things in, in clever ways with an ethical responsibility. And I agree, when you get lawyers involved, it takes a good six months and it goes through like 20 lawyers in a university system. And it's just, ex it's exhausting a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's adversarial and it shouldn't be adversarial. This should be a partnership. Mm -hmm. So that would be definitely, definitely a best practice of um, museums and libraries working through. and. I know that uh, we have um, a few of the panelists that have to leave, but I wondered about the dealing with the collection of drug tri language and identifiers. What would you suggest that an archive or museum, uh, how they would address this working with repatriation and identifying the accurate tribal connection? And I wondered if you could answer that for us, um, uh, Jennifer, because um, I know that you've done quite a bit of work around that area. Yeah, and in the protocol section, there's also one just talking about cultural sensitivity and um, exactly kind of what you're you're talking about. The other thing I will add, and for those of you who are not aware of it or haven't seen it, but um, we developed um, and I led a um, protocols webinar series just about a variety of different topics like this. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat as well too, so everybody can see it. Um, let me make sure I have, I might not have the full uh, link here. Let me just double check. Um, yes, I believe that's correct. Um, if this link doesn't work, let me know and I can drop another one. But this is, uh, we did five webinar series over different topics and this was actually one of them um, in that five webinar series and this was, um, hosted by the Society of American Archivists, Native American Archives section, and also by the Sustainable Heritage Network. And we did this because there was the need for working through these different issues. So in each of these webinars, we talk through different topics. And one of the, uh, the uh, webinars was talking about um, cultural sensitivity and, and wording and how to change that. And one of the, of course, biggest lessons learned in talking through these issues. And um, we did this through talking through like actual examples, working with um, other repositories like the American Philosophical Society, um, the Library of Congress, all of these different larger institutions. And through that, um, the biggest lesson learned is that I think many institutions come in and they want these solutions very quickly. Um, and the biggest word of advice here is this is a slow process. You also have to be slow, um, slowing the process down. I think we are oftentimes want very quick solutions and um, this type of work with tribal communities should not be approached in that way. It should be very slow and working collaboratively with the communities. Um, I think, and not only working within uh, my own institution, but also other institutions that I've asked to um, be a consultant on. Again, a huge lesson learned for different examples from that is, um, I think, again, we we want a simple solution, um, which sometimes there can be with changing the wording, but also the most important thing I've seen and learned is that um, instead of just thinking, oh, we need this simple solution, or we wanna create this, this project, or we have this funding to do this project, 
um, start with conversations with the tribal community first, because you might be heading in a direction that um, is actually not the right solution. And so just sitting down and having the conversations, I know, for example, even just with a um, couple of the examples that's been shared here today for the actual return of collections, that I don't think is where they probably started the conversation, but because they actually sat down and started to build relationships, people probably realized, oh, maybe us having this collection is not even the best thing um, in the best interest of either of our institutions. So we need to return the collection. So um, building the relationships with the tribes over time is where you get these answers. It is not always gonna be a simple solution, but um, it's also about educating yourself too. So, and, and, and again, that goes back to our same comment about um, not just putting everything on the tribe, it's also up to curators and archivists and um, those information professionals who are over these collections to educate yourselves, which is why we are so glad so many people are here today listening, um, that it's also up to these people. Educate yourselves to also come into these meetings with like, okay, I've listened to all this, now tell me what I need to do next and be open to what they're telling you because... Um, that's what it's all about is building the relationships and listening. Um, and that's where you're going to get the answers. Great. And that is such a good point. And it really leads us into our last question from the audience that museums, um, there are museums that have formal repatriation liaisons to build those relationships, which is a good start, like the Autry in uh, L.A., um, and it seems like library archives and museums could benefit from having a staff um, person trained to liaison and collaborate for institutions. And I just wondered, Wendy, if you wanted to address um, uh, that um, uh, qu question. And it says about um, uh, deciding to be proactive. And so uh, why would you feel that having a liaison would be um, especially important um, uh, coming from your position? You know, I think it's it's critically important because none of the people that we spoke to at any of these institutions were Native. Um, and so they weren't Indigenous, they, but they had good hearts. And that made all the difference for us. But I think having a li liaison who can really understand what it means to approach a tribal community. And as we all say, if you know one tribe, you know one tribe, right? Um, so because there are so many of us and we are also very different. Um, but I think having a liaison who could really be that person to talk with the tribe and to understand what the tribe's needs are and what the tribe's goals are um, is really, really critical. Uh, I, I used the example with David Skelly at Yale. Um, you know, I said, well, we had tea diplomacy because I went to his house. We had a cup of tea. We talked about this and we came up with this very simple solution. Um, and I think, you know, that that should happen, you know, it, because it still is that person to person um, relationship that you build that helps you create this good outcome. Um, so I think having a liaison who I, at least understands how to approach an Indigenous community. And I was fortunate to be part of a repatriation ceremony of um, bones that were kept at Yale with the Maori people and the, the Maori people were bringing their ancestors home. Um, and that was very moving. Um, but again, it really has to do with the motivations and the willingness and the open and to be open to understanding what this means. So I think having a liaison is a great start. Thank you so much. And I wondered, um, Wendy, if did you want to um, uh, take on uh, the last question about the labor of tribes and creating those relationships um, um, and wonder if this is still a good way of acknowledging that by requesting that? Yeah, I mean, uh, building relationship is critically important. Um, uh, going back to having someone who's dedicated within the museum or institution to working with tribes, I think is critical. You should never outsource relationship building that should come from within and it should be long. And, and while repatriation might be a first step and wanting to look at all of the collections, all of the materials that are within an institution and helping to write that, it is then using that sort of starting point and conversation to extend how it is that the museum can serve the community. These are, these are local, these are often local community members. And um, just as Lynn was saying, you wanna make sure that they're always available and always a part of the ongoing work. 
especially if you have someone like the Maori who need to have a land introduction. And so they really want to be introduced to the land from those original caretakers. And so it's important the museum has that ongoing and constant relationship building. I want to say thank you so much. And I think we're going to end with relationship building. And I'm going to um, raise my hands and the way that we do in the West Coast and say thank you, Madhu Cho, from um, my innermost being. I thank you for all of your time and um, for your expertise. I know I learned a lot today and I really value the time that you spent with all of us. And um, I hope that we can have more events like this in the future. So thank you so much to our hosts and to, to uh, UCLA and thank you for your gift of knowledge today. Thank you, thank you so much everybody for coming. Um, uh, great speakers and moderator, I learned so much. And um, please do when you get the um, survey to answer that because we do wanna know how to move forward, not just with this discussions, but with anything, with any ideas you have, because we're, we at UCLA are also learning as much as you are. Um, we have a program tomorrow, which is also focused on pathways and solutions and potentials. So if you want to go to that, that would be great. Um, and we do have an exhibit that talks about the return, repatriation of um, Jewish books to the Judaica to the Jewish Museum in Prague, which started this whole conversation in the first place. So check that out. And also just continue checking the guides and we'll add the links there to the recordings and all that stuff. So thank you everybody. Thank you for coming. Have a good evening, day, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye.